I chose my topic uh, high flow nasal cannula in the ED. I <clears throat> feel like <clears throat> I've used it, I've seen it, but unlike uh, <clears throat> a ventilator or a BiPAP machine where I'm very comfortable, you know, adjusting the settings and I know how to use it for what indications, high flow I feel like is relatively new. We don't use it as much and I didn't really know how, like what settings to start it on or really for sure. I mean, I kind of like heard anecdotally, you know, oh, like when could you use it for? So I, and this, a full topic, a full talk on this would be more than 10 minutes. So I'm just going to kind of hit on some of the highlights. Um, <clears throat> so the, this is the high flow machine. Um, well, there, these are two different ones. Um, is there a light on this? Yeah, or? The top. Red one? Nice. Um, <clears throat> so this is, I think this looks like the one I think that we, they, we have at like Monty. Um, there's just different companies. This one's Vapotherm. This is OptiFlow or something like that. This looks, I think the one I've seen in Jacoby looks more like this one. Um, <clears throat> just so like that is the high flow when you've seen that. That's not some fancy BiPAP or something. Uh, and then <clears throat> these are the nasal cannula. Um, <clears throat> they're just, you know, some of them have these like <clears throat> fancy sticky strips. Uh, just to kind of hold them. They're a little bit softer um, than the regular nasal cannula. Um, <clears throat> so traditional nasal cannula um, or like low flow nasal cannula um, in terms of the FiO2 and the flow rate. So room air is, you know, 21% FiO2. Um, nasal cannula at 2 liters is about 28% FiO2. When going up to six liters, which you know, how often do you have somebody on six liters nasal cannula? You really don't. is is about 44 percent. You kind of go up by four <coughs> percent for every liter of um, uh, flow that you go up on the nasal cannula. But as we all know, the problem with nasal cannula is it's really dry. Um, there's a low relative FiO2. It's low flow. Um, so I mean, you're really only putting that on for somebody that needs a little bit of oxygen, and you can't really crank it up. Um, and you can't really use it to reverse any processes. It's more just to give some supplemental oxygen. <clears throat> so what is high flow nasal cannula? So there's um, kind of like four components or five components to it. Um, and this is just kind of a schematic. Obviously, depending on the machine, uh, it's going to look different. But <clears throat> so there's the flow meter, which adjusts the flow. Um, how much oxygen is getting delivered per minute, the um, FiO2 blender. Um, there's a humidifier and you'll see there's like a bag of sterile water up top uh, and then the um, uh, and then it heats the the air and then it's delivered uh, through to the nasal cannula to the patient. So there's really three settings on the high flow. Um, the flow, liters per minute, the FiO2, and the temperature. I just put this one up because I don't know, I like their design. It's <laughs> Very easy. There's just three bright numbers. The Monty one. Yeah, I think this is the Monty. Three numbers. Yeah, I think this one is the 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 Monty one. Um, I, and I th again, I think the Jacoby one is OptiFlow or something. So it's that other one. Um, <clears throat> so how does how does high flow work? Other, it's not just like blasting higher air. So <clears throat> works in a couple ways. So first, it warms and humidifies the air, which in turn warms and humidifies your secretions. Um, <clears throat> Uh, which can decrease um, like air, uh, da just damage to the to the airway from uh, uh, dry air. <clears throat> also, I think so. The high flow you can increase to higher than your minute ventilation. So your normal minute ventilation is five to eight liters a minute. Um, but obviously, if you are if you're septic or you have pneumonia, you're going to have an increased minute ventilation because you're going to have increased oxygen demand. <clears throat> so if you're giving somebody you know two liters per minute by nasal cannula or something like that, they're they're going to be just breathing in a lot of room air, um, and they're going to have a lot of uh, kind of uh, dead space um, because they're breathing in more. Uh, they're breathing in more liters than they're actually getting in oxygen. Um, so by increasing the flow to higher than the minute ventilation, you can kind of wash out the nasopharyngeal um, dead space, wash out that CO2, fill it with oxygen. <clears throat> and then there's there's also this thought that it, it has some kind of like CPAP effect that you can get some PEEP. Um, <clears throat> based on like the different sources I was looking at, some said up to seven, like the manufacturer said up to seven, <laughs> um, <clears throat> some said as low as two, but they're thinking maybe up to five centimeters with like a perfectly fitting nasal cannula with your mouth closed because then when you open your mouth you lose the peep because then it just comes out your mouth. Um, <clears throat> so tell the patient not to open their mouth. Only, only about the flow rate of 50. <laughs> so Right, yeah, and this is like cranked all the way up. Um, and then I think some were saying it was like 0.38 centimeters uh, of water for every like 10 liters of flow or something. Um, 
And then also you get high flow rates. Um, so in the with the adult tubing, you can get up to 60 liters a minute. Um, and then for the tiniest, for infants, the tubing is eight liters per minute. Um, <clears throat> you're not, so it, there's actually, an, um, we're talking about Scott Weingart, he had a, you know, on the, the MCRIT, and he was just kind of talking about, uh, talking about saying the, the 60 liters, if you think about it, if you actually got 60 liters per minute delivered into your lungs with your mouth closed, you'd pop a lung. So you're definitely like losing some of this flow. You're not actually getting the full 60 liters. You're getting some percentage of that. Um, uh, but you're not so. But it, th these are what the settings are. So you're setting it 60 liters, but just know you're not like actually blasting their lungs with 60 liters. Um, is probably some percentage of that. <coughs> so there's a lot of indications for it. Traditionally, it was just for hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, <coughs> but other patients that would be good for it would be like DNR DNI patients that maybe they wouldn't tolerate the BiPAP or it's just really uncomfortable and you want to spare them. <coughs> um, you know, it can help somebody get to the palliative care service so they don't expire in the ER. Um, you know, if someone's not tolerating the BiPAP mask. In peds, um, they'll use it a lot for bronchiolitis, asthma, pneumonia. Um, <clears throat> I mean, theoretically, yeah, it'd be great to use it for pre-oxygenation or apneic oxygenation for RSI, but it takes a couple minutes to set up, so you're probably not going to like, oh, go set up the, nasal, the high flow so that I can pre-oxygenate this person to RSI them. Um, <clears throat> And then recently, there's been some talk that possibly due to this minimal um, uh, CPAP effect that it has, and you know that maybe you could use it for hypercapnic respiratory failure. Um, there is a new study that I'll just talk briefly about that kind of address that. So <clears throat> how to set up, there's just three settings. There's temperature, usually set to 37 degrees Celsius. Um, your flow rate, five to 60 liters. Um, I, it was hard to find kind of a standardized protocol for what to do, so th this suggestion is from, from up to date. This is kind of what they recommended. Um, starting in adults, 20 to 35 liters a minute, and then just kind of increase every couple of minutes by five to 10 liters. Um, and uh, the FiO2 is, can be you know, room air to 100%, and just as kind of like with like ARD settings, you don't want to give too much oxygen. Um, so they're suggesting going up on the flow rate, and then as you're starting to increase on the flow rate, if you're not seeing response, you can kind of start creeping up on the FiO2, but generally to not make it go higher than you need to. Um, and then in pediatrics, um, there's, they kind of do it uh, weight-based. So if they're less than 10 kilos, it's 10 or two liters per kg per minute. Um, and then this, this actually was from, this last part was from, it was like the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. They had their PICU, um, they had their PICU high flow protocol up there and um, it seemed to be, because a lot of the, it, it was hard to find an exact, some, some just said two, two liters per kg per minute for over, for over 10 kilograms. But that, so this one seemed more reasonable. It was saying that, you know, so you, you get your, um, two liters per kg per minute for the first 10, and then just for half uh, every after that, uh, or, or like half a liter per kilogram after that. So um, kind of like with maintenance fluids, you know, once you hit the first, uh, you go down. So, but uh, you'll look that up, you know, if, if you're using it. Um, so temperature, 37 degrees, and an adult start, you know, 20 to 35 liters, up or down, uh, and then the FiO2, I'd probably start around, I mean, 40%, you know, 50%, and then you kind of go up and down uh, based on what you need. Um, <clears throat> and then this is just the, the last thing. So there recently was, this was, actually it was in, uh, Dr. Chertoff sent the journal watch, and they had mentioned it in here. This is like an in-press article, <clears throat> and um, it was basically non-inferiority trial of high flow versus BiPAP. <clears throat> and the, um, so it was multi-center, non-blinded, randomized, um, non-inferiority, and they had a, the primary outcomes were treatment failure, meaning you had to be intubated, and arm failure, meaning they, the treating physician said, you're not getting better on this therapy, we're going to switch you to the other arm. So either from high flow to BiPAP or BiPAP to high flow. Obviously way less people, if BiPAP wasn't working, got switched to high flow. If BiPAP wasn't working, they were more likely just to get intubated. And then they had secondary outcomes like blood gases, um, uh, vital sign trends. Um, that was hypoxic. <coughs> So this was so it was all comers. It was, it was all comers. But you did, you did. <laughs> right. It, so yeah. So I'll, I'll talk about that. So um, the results, looking at all comers, so COPD, CHF, everything, they said, and this is what they said in their paper was high flow had non-inferior intubation rates, arm failures, and similar vital signs and blood gas trends. And this was their conclusion. 
I put in quotes, high velocity nasal insufflation is non-inferior to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for the treatment of undifferentiated respiratory failure in adult patients presenting to the ED. So it was a pretty bold thing. So people are saying, oh, you know, it's, it's just as good. You know, we can get rid of our BiPAPs. I mean, but there's a lot of problems with the study. First, it was industry funded by Vapotherm, who makes one of those. Uh, some of the authors were even actually employees of Vapotherm. Everyone got paid by Vapotherm. Um, they per participate in the, and this is coming out in Annals of Emergency Medicine. Um, they participate in the design of the protocol, the selection and the management of the sites. <clears throat> and then, like Dan was saying, so there were only 204 patients, about 100 in each arm. And the, the, these are the top discharge diagnoses. It was, you know, a quarter were COPD, a little less were heart failure, 14% were pneumonia, and then 14% were like mixed hypoxic hypercapnic respiratory failure. And there wasn't enough power <coughs> to do a, any sub-analyses between the groups. <coughs> so like exactly like Dan said, they're, they're basically they're lumping everyone together and saying, well, overall, there was, there, it was non-inferior. But it's, it, I don't really think that you can draw that conclusion if you're not, because I, you, we know that the physiology is different um, depending on the etiology of your uh, of your respiratory failure, so <clears throat> that was a really big problem with it. I thought to just come to this big conclusion that oh, high flow is not inferior when you don't really know what effects you're getting, you know, based on. And then <clears throat> another problem with it was they did it as an intention to treat model. So <clears throat> there were out of the hundred, you know, about a hundred people in each arm, twenty-seven of them uh, in the high flow failed. So twenty-three of those people, so almost a quarter of those patients, got switched to BiPAP. Um, and in BiPAP, seventeen people uh, failed, and all, oh, six of them they switched to high flow, uh, and then the rest. Um, Actually, only three got intubated in each group, so I'm not sure what happened to the other like 11 people that failed the BiPAP. But the the point the point of this is that so almost a quarter of the high flow people got switched to BiPAP, but because it was intention to treat, if those people didn't get intubated, they were that they they did not have the um, the failure they did not have a failure a treatment failure to say that um, they needed to get intubated. So if those people on high flow had stayed on high flow and not switched to BiPAP, would they have needed to be intubated? Was so there, wasn't one of their outcomes though, like switching to the other arm? <coughs> yeah, but it's not clear from the paper and it doesn't seem that they... Because <coughs> um, those people failed that treatment and needed to get switched to the other arm. Right, but then, but then in terms of the needing to get intubated though, but because they look at them separately though, they, they, they look at them separately. So they're looking at, so they're saying that, yeah, statistically the arm failure was, was like non-inferior between the two, and the treatment failure was non-inferior between the two, but um, because they're looking at these things separately, the, the pe people that got switched into one, like... Did not necessarily <laughs> get treatment failure, but they got arm failure. Right, exactly. They got arm failure, but then they weren't counted as a treatment failure as needing to be intubated. Gotcha. So 23 people... Was there a statistical <laughs> significance between the arm failures? There, so, um, no, and it was, I was looking through, they kind of did it weird and they, they set like a 20% difference as their cutoff for being non-inferior. Um, <laughs> there was not, but there was like a trend towards it. It was kind of the confidence interval was, it was I don't know, it was like, um, you know, it just barely crossed zero in terms of saying that it's it, it was not significant. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it, it's it's a you know a terrible crap study and we should disregard it, but I, I I don't think we can hang our hat on this study and say that um, it's fine for all comers. Um, I think that it just means that okay, you know, it is support that maybe you know high flow is good, but um, I think that there needs to be more studies to for specific indications, um, uh, specific indications for respiratory failure. Um, so don't throw out your BiPAP and those are my sources.